Dr. Agim, her beautifulness is here. Her brilliance is also here. Um, and I'm just so excited to have her back uh, doing another T4 talk for us. We're doing extra cutaneous um, pediatric dermatology. And Dr. Agim is going to talk to us about some ocular involvement, some um, oral involvement, and maybe even some auditory involvement. All three we might be able to pack into the session, but she cannot hear me, but I can hear her. So I'm going to give her the thumbs up here and then we're going to get rocking and rolling with Dr. Agim. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the privilege to be able to share this lecture with you. Um, this has been fun during this series. Um, and today the topic I wanted to cover, we titled it Extracutaneous Dermatology. Um, the goal of this lecture is to talk about how to use our spider senses as dermatologists um, when we're seeing patients, um, how we can pick up clues that are um, outside of the skin but feed into the diagnoses that we can pick up. I'm going to start my slides here. Please let me know if there's something I need to pause for. Um, otherwise, I'll just try and get through with the time that we have. Um, I do not have any conflicts of interest to share uh, regarding this talk. My goal is for us to be able to distinguish uh, clinical features beyond the skin that can help assist taking care of patients that present to a dermatology clinic. Um, sometimes a patient may come in with one complaint, but as you're assessing them, taking the history, getting the physical exam, you may notice other things about their features that suggest there may be more to the story than just what's written in the skin. Um, so in this talk, I wanted us to cover um, auricular fe features, oral features, and a few um, ocular features that could suggest um, a condition that has both cutaneous and extracutaneous features. So speaking about ears, um, are the faces where we focus when we're first talking to a patient? So it's easy to get a quick scan of the eyes, the ears, and the mouth, and then we move on to whatever part of skin their chief complaint may, may um, be concerned about. Um, the ears, the first thing you may notice about them is their shape and size, and then you may notice whether the ear, the patient is wearing any jewelry, and then anything distinct about the shape of their ears. Um, there have been particular physical features that are associated with certain conditions that dermatologists may see. If the ears are low set or rotated posteriorly, if they're large, um, larger than normal, if they stick out from the skull, if they have extra hair, if the color is different, for example, if the ear is more red or, or dark, if the ear has swelling in any particular region at the top of the ear, the bottom of the ear, those things can suggest that there be, may, may be more going on with the patient's presentation. Um, so for example, an auricular anomaly to think about is something called a linear crease. This is a simple line that can occur along the ear lobule or sometimes along the superior helix. Pictured here are two cases of infants with helical creases um, that also have on the left macroglossia, so enlargement of the tongue, and an omphalocele, which is uh, apparent immediately at birth. So if you recall to a neonatal unit, for example, and you see a baby with helical creases, macroglossia, and omphalocele, you should be thinking about something like beckwith wiedemann syndrome. Another malformation of the ear that may be apparent upon first encountering a patient is if their ears are low set. Um, what do I mean by low set? The picture here on the right shows what would be considered the normal alignment of the external ear or the pinna compared to the skull. Usually you can draw a line from the top of the superior helix across to the lateral canvas of the eye. Um, on the lower picture here, if you try and draw that same line, the, you don't meet the top of the ear. So the ear is dropped down lower um, for what, from where you would expect it to be. Uh, low set ears or low set pinnae can be seen in a number of trisomies, including 13, 18, and 21. It is a feature in a lot of the rasopathies, including neurofibromatosis. 
It can be seen in Settler's syndrome, which we think about in patients who have bitemporal uh, aplasia cutis. Um, it's also a feature in some of the premature aging syndromes like restrictive gammopathy. Um, Rubinson Tabi syndrome patients will also feature a fused, uh, fused eyebrows and short, broad thumbs with brachydactyly and brachionychia. And then Beckwith Muterman, which we talked about having the helical creases, those patients may also have low set pinna. Two other short stature syndromes, Turner syndrome and Noonan syndrome, may feature low set ears. And for those two conditions, the ears may also be rotated posteriorly relative, relative to the axis you would expect for a normal sitting pinna. What about hairy ears? So hairy ears are, are a genetic trait that can run in families. Um, sometimes the baby is hairy all over. Sometimes only the ears are hairy. When just the ears uh, or the uh, helix is hairy, that's considered uh, hypertrichosis pinnaeoris. It's a characteristic transmitted with the Y chromosome. Um, and it's speculated that this is a desirable feature um, because it, it can increase the acuity of hearing. Um, when the baby is hairy all over, including the hairs, um, they could have either a lunugo like a generalized hypertrichosis or generalized hypertrichosis with terminal hairs in hypertrichosis universalis congenita. Sometimes a baby is born uh, postdates with extra hair that later sheds. The first three conditions that I talked about, the hair tends to persist throughout life unless there's an intervention, um, but there's also a transient um, phase of hypertrichosis in babies um, from mothers who suffer with um, gestational diabetes. Um, we also see acquired hypertrichosis of the ears in patients who have been placed on cyclosporin for a long time. More commonly in adults, but occasionally in uh, teenagers, it can be a perineoplastic phenomenon, and that's usually seen in patients who have GI cancers. What about red ears? So auricular erythema could be from trauma, heat, um, but when we see the erythema in particular areas and it's more fixed and persistent, we need to think about inflammatory disorders. Um, for example, if you see erythema confined to the cartilaginous upper portions of the ear, that can be seen in relapsing polychondritis. This may be a patient who presents, for example, for oral ulcers and you diagnose them with APVA, and you notice that their ears are red as well. This can prompt you to work them up for relapsing polychondritis. Involvement of the nose is a later feature. These are patients who, if their cartilage is uh, inflamed enough, they can develop a saddle nose deformity. Um, and this can also be seen in patients who have additional features um, such as joint pain. Um, the ears may also be red in patients who have juvenile springtime eruption, which is sort of a form of polymorphous light eruption where during the springtime you see patients who have sensitivity to exposure to UV light and they develop redness on the ears. Um, a sunburn can cause red ears and contact dermatitis can cause red ears. So patients who, uh, for example, are wearing over, over ear headphones if they're allergic to components of the rubber material um, from the headphones or metal, um, that can cause redness in the areas of contact uh, on the ears. What about if the top of the ear is fine and just the lobula is red? If you see redness on the lobula, especially with infiltration, that could be a sign of borreliol lymphocytosis. This is a longer um, term or tardive feature um, following a tick bite from the U European derma center. Um, another common feature you may see around the ear is a preauricular pit or sinus. Isolated pits can run in families. Um, some people have a pit that's unilateral, some people have bilateral pits. The most common um, association outside of the skin would be for hearing loss. So usually for these patients, you want to make sure they've 
pass the initial hearing screen. Um, if they're having any difficulty with learning at school, you want to refer them to audiology to have a repeat hearing test if they said they passed the first one, um, because that's something that can be picked up easily and any accommodations made for the child. Um, Preauricular pits or sinuses can be associated with some rare syndromes. beckwith wiedemann pops up again. It now has three of the features we've talked about around the ears. Um, it can be a feature in patients who have structural malformations of the face or in brachioorenal syndromes. Um, these patients uh, also have either a history of uh, renal anomalies or you could refer them to get an ultrasound and that is then discovered after looking at their um, preauricular pits. So if you see just the pit, the question is, does the pit end, you know, a couple millimeters into the skin, or is there a sinus that connects either into the ear canal, into the cheek, into the salivary gland? It's difficult to tell sometimes just by looking at the patient. Um, at times, if there is a sinus connecting into the deeper tissues, this can become periodically inflamed or sometimes super infected. So if they present with just a pit with no associated inflammation, um, you can image to determine whether the pit extends into a, an official sinus or deeper. Um, and if it's one that has a sinus with a connection into the ear canal or the cheek, or even if it's a blind ended long sinus, because of the risk of repeated inflammation and infection, these patients should be referred to an auto uh, laryngologist. The super infections could be bacterial. Um, they could be what would be considered common cells normally on the skin. Um, and I've actually seen some patients also develop mycobacterial super infections um, of their pericular pits uh, or sinuses. Um, so these, this is a, an imp important pickup that we can um, notice on a patient, refer them for imaging to map the extent of the uh, involvement of the pit or sinus and then um, counsel them about potential associations, the most common being either hearing loss or super infection. And these can be excised if they become problematic. Um, so some patients actually will have both pits and accessory tragi or tags in front of the ear. Again, the tags can be solitary or multiple. They can be unilateral or bilateral. Um, they can be sporadic, they can be familial. Um, when they are multiple and bilateral, it's more likely that they could have an underlying syndrome. Um, some of the syndromes that can feature accessory trachea are usually uh, conditions where there's an abnormality in the development of the branchial arches. Um, some include golden heart syndrome. These patients will also have uh, microsomia of the face. Uh, Delman syndrome, where these patients will also have aplasia cutis uh, of the head and neck. Um, some of the patients that have um, structural malformations that are pretty obvious on initial uh, um, assessment um, include patients that have Treacher Collins um, of the vectoral spectrum. So microtia means um, a small ear. Um, this is graded from what would be considered normal by the otolaryngologist down to four classes of um, diminution of the expected external ear. Um, this is an important feature from a dermatologist standpoint because it's one of the uh, side effects that can be seen in an embryo that's exposed to isotretinoin. And we prescribe isotretinoin all the time for acne. Um, this can be seen as well in golden heart syndrome and in patients that have a hemifacial microsomia. So, uh, a keloidal helix is um, an acquired abnormality. Um, this is separate from a classic keloid that's de that develops after trauma. We do see keloids in children, especially after piercing. Interestingly, children who receive piercings right at birth rarely ever keloid or form keloids. Um, but children who pierce after the period of infancy, um, if there's a genetic tendency or family history of keloids, are more likely to make keloids later. We think this may be due to how collagen is um, processed in an infant versus an adult, the same way sometimes scars that are um, uh, acquired in infancy or even like when surgery is done in utero heal very differently from scars that occur later. 
But this is a, a, a different form of keloidal helix. Um, this is an infectious uh, condition. Um, it's caused by uh, an organism called Apasia lobuai. Um, it's endemic to the Americas. It's very common around the Amazon basin, but it's also seen here in the U.S. Um, in the U.S., it's been reported as being transmitted uh, by bottlenose dolphins. Um, I think there were some cases, we're coming up on spring break, where people went to a water park and got splashed by the dolphins and had the organism implanted in their skin. Usually exposed skin is where the organism gets implanted. Um, on path, um, you tend to see a very distinct appearance of a string of beads um, in the affected area. Um, and treatment is usually with uh, excision or posaconazole. A uh, prominent ear um, or a prominent pinna is one that's considered to protrude more, more than two centimeters away from the skull. Um, this can be either due to a lesion pushing the ear out, such as a, a vascular malformation, um, or it's seen in conditions where there's some skin laxity, as in cutis laxa. It is a feature of Cochrane syndrome, um, and it's seen in patients with hemihypertrophy. And this can be surgically corrected if it's a problem for the patient. Moving on to features that we can see uh, in the eye. Most of these you can see while you're looking at the patient and can prompt you to ask more questions or examine other areas for supportive uh, diagnosis, for support for the diagnosis. Lish nodules are melancytic hematomas of the iris. Depending on the color of the iris, uh, the hematomas can range anywhere from appearing translucent through yellow to brown or sometimes blue or gray. Um, they are the most common ocular finding in adult neurofibromatosis patients. Usually, they are multiple and bilateral. Um, it's estimated that less than 5% of patients with neurofibromatosis will have these uh, before the age of three, but more than 50% after age six. So it's very probable that you will see a patient um, you know, in that early school age group. If you see a patient that has bilateral multiple iris hematomas, you definitely want to look for their caffeolae macules. Um, and um, work them up for restopathies, including neurofibromatosis. Lester's iris is where you have um, pigment splaying away from the pupil um, in a starburst pattern and also um, heading out towards the periphery of the eyes. Um, the appearance also varies based on the person's intrinsic iris color. Um, the other feature we see on exam would be triangular lunulae and nail dystrophy. Um, these patients may have a history of stiff elbows um, or dislocation of the knee because they have hypoplastic or absent patellae. Um, this is due to a mutation in LMX1B. And importantly, these patients um, can have renal complications and neurologic complications. So if you notice triangular lunulae and a Lester's iris, you want to work a patient up for um, nail patella syndrome. Um, colobomas are where there's a defect in the um, iris such that you look like, instead of having a round pupil, you may look like you have a, a slit pupil or a cat eye shape to the pupil. Um, it can be in any portion of the um, iris. Uh, it can be unilateral or bilateral. Um, these defects actually cause light sensitivity for the patient. And these patients are at increased risk for cataracts. Um, we do see colobomas as part of, uh, for example, focal dermal hypoplasia, where patients will also have blastoid atrophic lesions on the skin. Um, it can be a feature of incontinentia pigmenti, where patients will present with the four stages, beginning with you know blistering and uh, specific character patterns at birth that progresses through verrucous, hyper, and hypopigmented stages. Um, it has been reported after exposure of fetuses to alcohol and also in the charge syndrome. Um, microphthalmia refers to small underdeveloped eyes. Um, it can be an isolated finding. It can be iatrogenic. Um, again, related to isotretinoin, which we tend to prescribe as dermatologists. And it can also be part of syndromes such as the MIDAS spectrum. Um, so MIDAS features microphthalmia and linear skin defects, which are essentially a form of uh, aplasia cutis. The linear skin defects tend to occur on the head and neck. So you might notice them in the same region. 
Um, and they do tend to, the linear portion uh, of the findings tend to fade with time. So they're most prominent in infants and young children. Um, so if you notice both the skin finding and the ocular finding, of obviously you'd have them refer to ophthalmology and sometimes they, they can have cardiac complications as well. So they should be referred to cardiology. Um, heterochromic irises are where you have more than one color um, in the iris. Um, so this is a mother and son pair where they both have brown and blue gray segments to their irises. Um, and uh, you know this is obviously passed from the mother to the son. Um, it's due to uh, malformation in innervation of uveal melanocytes. Um, that's what causes the difference in some areas being brown and some areas being blue. Um, it has been reported in both iatrogenic and syndromic forms. The syndromic form we are most familiar with in dermatology is the Wardenburg syndrome. So these patients will also have a white forelock um, and they may have widely spaced eyes or a dystopic canthorum causing you know, relative um, hypertillerism. Um, there are four types of Wardenburg syndrome we need to go know about. We don't have to go into all that, um, but it's an important thing for us to know and learn about. Um, and the, the iatrogenic forms can be seen uh, related to birth trauma. Um, with patients who have brachial plexus injuries actually can develop uh, heterochromic irises. Um, ocular bulbar dermoids are seen in golden heart syndrome. These are patients, again, that can have hemifacial microsomia. Um, I, Dr. Bray, I don't know if you remember this, but when I was in fellowship, we had a patient who came in with preauricular pits, and we were going to excise her um, sinus. And while she was uh, asleep in the, in the OR, we said, well, I wonder if she has ocular bulbar dermoids, and we flipped her eyelids, and she did. And we ended up working her up and sh and uh, showing that she had one of these conditions. So you never know what's going to walk into, you know, your OR or your um, clinic. Um, so it's very important to always double check. Um, you might pick up something that changes the course of a patient's life. Um, ocular bulbar dermas are also seen in basal cell nevus syndrome. And those patients may present to us with palmar pits and multiple hematomas on their skin. It's also seen in Proteus syndrome, where these patients may have connective and epidermal uh, nevi. Um, retinitis pigmentosa, I'm just mentioning this briefly because we need to do, know this is dermatologist. We would not be the ones seeing this necessarily on an exam, but we may see the cutaneous features, for example, of ichthyosis um, uh, and patients who have uh, complaints of night blindness or patients who have scissor gait or patients who have family history of cancer. Um, all of, there are a lot of syndromes that have retinitis pigmentosa in different forms um, related to their skin condition and a referral to ophthalmology would be um, appropriate if you have a patient with the relevant cutaneous presentation and a history of, for example, loss of night vision in childhood, because uh, that's usually the first sign before it progresses. Um, I wanted to round out with a few oral observations. Um, I class these into distinctions in dentition and then a few mucosal things that we might notice just when we're interacting with the patient, talking with them. Normally, um, you can see their teeth, you can see a little bit of their tongue, you can see their lips. And if you notice something unusual, it might be a prompt to ask more questions um, and maybe pick up something that can help. So erythrodontia is where a patient has red teeth. Um, this is seen in congenital erythropoietic porphyria, which is a deficiency in the uroporphyrinogen 3 synthase. Um, these patients accumulate the products that are, um, they cannot break down in heme synthesis in many different uh, parts of their body. So it's it, uroporphyrin 1 and coproporphyrin accumulate in their plasma, in their red blood cells, in urine, feces, in their teeth. Um, and you can use a, a UV light um, to even enhance the visibility of the um, erythrodontia. Um, the same feature is in their urine and the woods lamp will make that glow as well. Other features they may present with include hypertrichosis, hyperpigmentation, 
Um, and these patients typically will have photosensitivity with blistering and scarring in the fragile skin on exposed areas. Um, enamel hypoplasia um, can cause uh, defects on the teeth in the form of pits or striations. Um, you can have small or large pits. Small enamel pits are seen in patients with epidermolysis bullosa. Um, striated enamel or where you see actual lines on the, on the teeth can be seen in gold syndrome or focal dermal hypoplasia. And these are similar to the striations that are seen um, on the skeletal survey of patients with focal dermal hypoplasia. You can have yellow spotted enamel in the jelly franchetti jessen syndrome, which we also call the you know, immigration delay disease or because these patients have compromised dermatoglyphs. When, when they try to get fingerprints on them, they don't have the same patterns that you would expect because they, because they have some effacement. Um, and then large enamel pits um, and gingival fibromas are seen in patients with tuberous sclerosis. The large enamel pits would be an early finding and the gingival, fib gingival fibromas develop around puberty when you start to see the periungal fibromas as well um, and the facial angiofibromas. And then hypodontia refers to teeth that are smaller um, or uh, different in shape. Um, one of the most common ones that we see is when patients have you know, pointed conical or peck-shaped teeth. Um, this can be seen in hypohydrotic ectodermal dysphagia, as in this patient pictured here. He has sparse eyebrows. Um, he has uh, thicker lips. Uh, he has wispy hair. Usually their hair is a little lighter colored than other family members. Um, these patients also have dry skin, um, dry eyes, and they are at risk for heat stroke. So if you see a patient like this, you can work them up for ectodermal dysplasia um, and um, counsel them about how to manage everything moving forward. The teeth are important for the shape of the face. So it's not just cosmetic. It really affects speech, it affects feeding, affects so many aspects of these patients' life. Uh, so noticing this and working them up and getting them the support and resources they need is really important. Um, the other thing to note is that for the X-linked version of this ectodermal dysplasia, up to 80% of their mothers have dental findings. They will not be as dramatic as you see in the baby boys, but if these are picked up in the mother, uh, accommodations can be made during the perinatal care to prepare for the baby. So there are less risks for um, hyperparaxia and uh, you know febrile seizures and all of those things during infancy. Um, and then establishing the diagnosis is really important to having coverage for all of the support they need throughout their life, including replacement of the teeth. Um, there are a few other ectodermal dysplasias, for example, as those due to WNT10A, where um, they may not have the full-blown um, compromise to their you know, sweat glands and dry skin, but they have dental anomalies um, that you can pick up. Um, Missing teeth is anodontia, microdontia is smaller teeth. Both of those can be seen in epidermal lysis bullosa as well. In Vanderwood syndrome, this is what we, we talk about in patients who have lip pits or sinuses, um, usually on the lower lip. Um, they can have cleft lip and palate as well, uh, in addition to smaller missing teeth. And then there's a condition called oculodental digital dysplasia where there's also abnormalities of the fingers. Um, Gardner syndrome, I think, is a very important one to know. These are patients who can present with polyodontia or a double row of teeth. Um, these are patients who have a very high risk for multiple different types of cancer um, due to mutations in the APC gene. Uh, in childhood, these are patients who may have a lot of GI complaints because they start to develop polyps in adolescence. Um, and it's important to identify them, pick up the condition, and start the management as early as possible to reduce the risk for the cancers that um, that they can develop throughout their life. These patients have a lot of cutaneous features as well. They may come in complaining about multiple cysts. They may have pilometricomas. Uh, they may have lipomas, um, fibromas, desmoid tumors, osteomas. But this, the uh, epidermoid cysts and the cystic pilometricomas start to show up in childhood. Um, and if you have a patient who has multiple cysts, just look at their teeth and see, do they have extra teeth? and then you would refer them um, for genetic testing. These patients also have an ocular feature where they have uh, congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium or chirpy. So you would refer these patients to ophthalmology as well. 
Um, a talent cusp is a single uh, curved uh, protuberance on the interior portion of the incisor. Um, it's a form of hypodontia. Um, it's seen in hypomelanosis of Edo. Um, you can have similar findings in patients with incontinentia pigmenti. The main distinction in patients with incontinentia pigmenti is that they have um, they can have microdontia, anodontia, um, talon cusp, but they their enamel usually is intact. Um, a lot of these other conditions will also have compromised enamel and increased risk for dental caries. And then basal cell neva syndrome, we mentioned this because they can have um, uh, the, the palmer pits and the multiple um, basaloid follicular hematomas. Um, if you saw those features, you obviously would be thinking about basal cell neva syndrome. They have the, the oral finding of odontogenic keratosis. Sometimes we've had where a dentist refers a patient to us to work up for basal cell neva syndrome because they have dental impaction they get a panorex, and they see the odontogenic keratosis, and they will sometimes send them and say, you know, um, rule out uh, basal cell neva syndrome. This is important to pick up in childhood because I, during childhood and uh, early adolescence, going into young adulthood, these patients have a higher risk for medulloblastoma. Um, and as they progress through adulthood, they do have uh, risk for other cancers. So these are patients that need to be identified early and screened regularly um, to get ahead of the potential complications. Um, and a couple more things here. One is um, destructive periodontitis. This can be seen, if you see this with a keratoderma, um, this can be seen in papillon lepers syndrome. And if you see this in a patient who has an atypical diaper dermatitis, it can be a sign of Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So depending on the additional cutaneous findings, um, it will determine if you're sending the patient for a skeletal survey or for test and you know, testing to identify the source of the keratoderma. There are multiple conditions that cause pigment um, on the lips or the tongue. Um, Banayan Riley Rubacaba tends to have um, macules that are perioral. Uh, Pugh Yeager tends to have pigmented macules on the lips as does Lorger Hansiker. Uh, Addison's disease can have more diffuse pigmentation of the buccal mucosa and the tongue. Um, this pictured here are pigmented papillae, which are benign, but you have individual papillae on the tongue develop uh, a dark pigment. Um, it can run in families or it can be isolated in the child. Um, dark discoloration can also develop with um, when someone is not like doing their tongue scraping with their oral care or after exposure to Pepto-Bismol or Bismuth. Geographic tongue is very common. It can be seen in isolation. There's a possible association with psoriasis. Um, it sometimes will run in families. Um, these patients present with areas of effacement and hypertrophy that migrate around uh, the tongue from time to time. For some patients, they're asymptomatic. For some patients, they do cause a burning sensation, um, and that can be treated with zinc uh, or with topical corticosteroids. Um, and then I'm ending on uh, just a mention about, you know, looking at a patient the size of their lips. If a patient presents with either intermittent, swe intermittent swelling or persistent swelling, it could be a sign of uh, more going on. So um, swelling that occurs not just isolated to the lips, but maybe sometimes involved in the periocular area. It could be due to angioedema. Um, if there's swelling that's accompanied by lingual placata or abnormalities on the tongue, you can see that in Nelkison Rosenthal. And um, a very important one to pick up in kids, if you have a patient who has either just swelling that initially is intermittent and then becomes persistent, or is it accompanied by uh, fissuring around the mouth a lot of GI complaints or failure to thrive, um, that could be a sign of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and so that the lip swelling may be the initial presentation that palms work up for, um, for this condition. Here are my references and I'm happy to take any questions. That was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> 
I have no doubt that everybody listening learned a lot. I know I did as well. Um, and let me just see if there's any questions. Does anybody have anything? I don't see anything in the chat right now, but any participants, any questions? All right, I'm going to let Dr. Agim know that there are no questions for her real quick. Since she can't hear me, I'm going to send her um, a text. Um, but yep, no questions. All right, y'all. Well, thank you for tuning in, either in person live here with us um, or um, virtually later on. I know this will be something that a lot of people go back to and listen to again um, because Dr. Gim is not only, again, beautiful, but brilliant um, and shared so many important tips. And like she pointed out, it's not just about knowing this for the boards. Um, we are lucky and blessed as dermatologists to be able to pick up on these small things that other people might miss when we're doing an exam. And there really is no reason to take a look um, in the eyes and the ears and the mouth. Um, because again, it's free, um, doesn't cost anything, no diagnostic tests are needed, and we really can change the trajectory of our patients' lives. So again, make sure that you open your own eyes and look at their eyes, their ears, their mouth, um, and along, along with their skin, especially in kiddos that may have something syndromic. So um, as always, it was wonderful to learn from Dr. Agim. Um, and if any questions do pop up later, please feel free to reach out to the PD Derm site on Sages. Um, but thank you for tuning in. And then we will see you on the 5th, potentially, on Leap Day. We have a bonus session on the 5th. Um, the fifth Thursday at five o'clock. And then we're going to be taking a little break in March um, just for the AAD and spring break. Um, but we will see you here for rare diseases day and some rare pediatric derm cases um, on leap day um, in a couple weeks. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And good thank night. You, thank you. Thank All right. you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.